Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Paul Wells to talk about the drums of Neil Peart. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Bart. I'm an absolutely honored to be here. Yes, this is a really fun one. I mean, Neil Peart, and it's taking everything in my being to not say pert because that's what I grew up <laughs> saying. And I know people yeah, listening. Me too. It's, it is Peart, though. So just to put it up, you know, right at the beginning, uh, I don't think he'd be too mad knowing that people call him Pert, but like it's Peart. So, but we're talking about the late, great uh, Neil Peart. And it's been a little bit of time since we lost him, but you are the correct person for this because you are a true uh, gear fanatic when it comes to Neil. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I am. Yeah, it's been a, <laughs> a something I've been. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his playing of, of their music and all of that, you know, obvious stuff. Um, but also just for some reason, my brain just likes to hone in on the gear of, of the musicians that I love. And, and I tend to have a, a relatively good memory for learning that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. It's it's interesting how I mean, this is a whole different topic, but how the brain works and you just hone in on certain things where someone might have no interest in gear, cannot remember anything. What did I play when I feel like Ringo is famously doesn't remember his, mm. much of his you know gear and things like that. But uh, we need people like you to keep track of all this stuff. So uh, right off the bat, this is probably going to be a longer episode. This might be a two parter. We're not sure at the point of recording this. We'll see how far we go, or it may just be the earlier years, um, because at a certain point in the 2000s, Paul and I were talking before, it sort of becomes a similar kit just with variations. We'll see what happens uh, as we go. But I want to mention before Paul starts in on his uh, I, with the pictures and I, we have all kinds of cool stuff. You did a great interview with Mike Dawson where you talked more about what got you into Rush and your background with all this stuff. So for the sake of time, is it fair to say we should just refer people to that episode to hear more about your information on your background with Rush? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we talk about, um, yeah, my interest in them and where I first heard them and things like that. But we also, that episode is really about kind of analyzing Neil's drumming um, and talking about a particular period of, of Rush's music that I think gets a little bit overlooked, which would kind of be this mid period of hmm. kind of the Signals album to the Counterparts album, 90, 82 through 93, roughly. And um uh, so yeah, that, that would be, you know, the source for that. We're not really going to talk about that kind of stuff. We're really kind of just going to go full on, on, on the gear. Sure. Here. Sure. We'll sum it up pretty simply and say, Paul likes rush <laughs> and then just move <laughs> on from there. Yes. So, um, all right, Paul, let's, well, first off, let me just tell people you are a drummer. You're an educator at Juilliard. Uh, you're an amazing mm -hmm. jazz drummer, similar to your friend, my friend, George Flutus, where you love this rock icon with George, it's Bonham. Uh, with you, it's Neil. And obviously, I know you enjoy other jazz drummers and all kinds of music, but this is your passion. Um, you're kind of a you guys are interesting fellas that way where you play, you know, straightforward jazz, but you really enjoy rock music as well. So um, all that being said, let's hop in here. Um, if you're listening yeah. in your car or walking your dog or whatever, just know that there this is going to be on YouTube as well. And I'm going to put up pictures, tons of pictures as we go. So be sure to check that out as well if you're just listening in the car. But um, here we go, Paul. Take it away. All right. Well, um, I should say at the very beginning, I would like to credit a few uh, sources um, and just give thanks to some people um, uh, that have helped me a lot. Um, I mean, a lot of this information I got from reading interviews in Modern Drummer Magazine and later uh, Drumhead and Drum Magazine. Um, there are also several books. Um, Joe Bergamini uh, wrote a great book um, about Neil taking center stage. Um, and then, of course, Neil's own writings in the Rush tour books have a lot of great gear information and different, you know, interviews and things that he's written for Modern Drummer. Um, but also, um, there are some interesting people um, that I've encountered. Um, uh, first of all, I'd have to say uh, a gentleman named Dean Bobasud, uh, who's a, a great friend who owned uh, Neil's first kit that he that he used with Rush, which we'll talk about all these kits, obviously. Wow. And um, 
And I actually worked with Dean and a, another gentleman named Michael Lowe, who's a great guy who uh, runs a website called neilpeartdrumsticks.com. And Michael mm. um, collects and knows everything there is to know about the drumsticks Neil used, which basically from his entire career with Rush was the Promark Oak 747 stick mm. wood tip. Um, apparently Neil liked, he loved that stick. He always used that stick. He used, uh, light versions of that stick, not heavy versions. He would request from Promark that they send them lighter versions. Um, so Michael hooked me up with Dean when Dean bought the, the, the kit, we call it Chromie. Um, that's the, uh, the kit used from fly by night to 2112. And I helped to sort of do some research on, um, sort of fixing up the kid and finding the missing parts. Um, another gentleman would be uh, Bob Millerat. I, I, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. He is the gentleman who currently owns Neil's Tama Candy Apple Red kit from the mm. 80s. And wow. he is a great source of information. Um, and um, yeah, I just, I wanted to just mention those sure. people first because I, I don't, this, you know, I've learned a lot from these, from these people. Um, also Robert Teleri, I should mention has done a ton of research, particularly again on the Tama kit. And there's a lot of good information that comes from him. I don't know him personally, but, um, uh, I just want to credit those people just to begin with. But, um, to start out, um, I guess we could start at Neil's very beginning. His very first drum kit was apparently a Stuart drum set, which was, I believe, a, uh, a made in Japan, sort of what they call a stencil brand. I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable about that. So they're, they're, they're people that are really deep into collecting those drums and researching them. Um, and the kit was basically a red sparkle 12, 16, 20 with a snare. Neil mentioned that he had a 16 inch, a single symbol, a 16 inch Ajax symbol. Um, and uh, interestingly, I think maybe one of Ringo's symbols is speculated to have been an Ajax yeah. um, early on, you know, so maybe because Neil was in Canada, uh, there was, you know, some sort of import, because I think Ajax might have been a European made symbol. Um, just to, to talk for a second about the Stewart kit, he, he mentioned in an interview that he traded with his friend. Um, he, for some reason, his friend had an 18 inch bass drum um, by the brand Capri, which I believe was a, a, an English, another English made drum set, uh, drum brand, but sort of a budget brand. And he sure. traded his 20 inch bass drum with his friend for his friend's 18 inch Capri bass drum. And 18 inch bass drums actually figure into Neil's drum sets throughout the years in an interesting way, because his, his next kit and his first sort of good kit that he got when I think he was about 16 was a, uh, Rogers kit, uh, gray ripple finish. The gray ripple kit was a 12, 14, 18 kit which is, you know, what we think of as a bebop kit. Sure. Um, and I don't know why, I mean, I, I speculate that he, something about the 18 inch bass drum of that Capri 18 inch bass drum that he really liked. And maybe when he ordered a Rogers kit, maybe he got those small sizes cause they were the cheaper sizes. Maybe it was a little cheaper than getting a bigger kit, or maybe he really dug those sizes. I don't actually yeah. know. Um, yeah. that kit, also had a uh, power tone, um, a metal power tone snare. I guess it would be a chrome over brass power tone. Um, he talked about wanting a Dynasonic, but that was too expensive. So he got a power tone instead. Now there's a picture of him with a double bass drum. Looks like matching. Yes. Did he like borrow a buddies or something? Or He ordered um, another 12 and another 18 to make it a bigger kit um, cool. a few years later. And that's what he used, you know, sort of in his later teenage and, and early 20s, I guess. He um, played in bands around the St. Catharines, Ontario area, which is near Niagara Falls, which is where he grew up. And then he moved to England for a year. This is all well documented in his various, sure. you know, writings and in bios about him. But he, he lived in, in London for a year, um, kind of trying to, you know, find fame and fortune. And um, I, I believe those are the drums he would have taken with him. And at some point that kit, he, um, he actually refinished that kit. He, he was a huge, huge fan of Keith Moon. And around the time that, uh, Tommy came out, um, Keith Moon was playing a premiere kit with a chrome finish. This was the kit 
Keith Moon used after the famous pictures of Lily kit, which was a black premiere kit with a bunch of um, sort of panels of, of um, different designs. Yeah. And um, the kit after that was a chrome finish kit. And, and uh, Neil talked about seeing the who in that time period a few times. So he may have seen him play that chrome kit. So he actually rewrapped his Rogers kit in apparently uh, chrome wallpaper or silver <laughs> wallpaper, um, sort of a cheap way of, of uh, yeah. you know, f- refinishing that. And that is the kit that he played when he auditioned for Rush. That was the wow. kit that he brought with him to the audition. And then once he got the gig, um, he officially joined on Getty Lee's birthday. Um, I think it was Getty's 21st birthday. It's, I think, July 29th, 74. Hmm. And right after they were about to start touring, they were, they started touring in um, August of 74. And um, they had a record company advance for the tour. So they went to a uh, music store in Toronto uh, called Long and McQuaid Music, I believe. Hmm. And they bought a bunch of gear for their upcoming tour, which is like everybody's dream. You know, you're, (laughs) you join a band, they're on a, they're on a label, they get an advance from the label for tour support and you go to the music store and you buy your dream stuff. So, so Neil bought a Slingerland kit, which um, had a Chrome finish. And that is the kit that has since become known as Chromey. Gotcha. Um, this is the kit that I mentioned my friend Dean um, owned for a while and that I helped him restore. And Chromie initially was um, two 14 by 22 inch bass drums, um, three rack toms. Um, now, the sizes are kind of a little weird. The first rack tom is a 9 by 13. The second mm-hmm. one is also a 9 by 13. And the third one is a 10 by 14 and then a 16 by 16 floor tom. And at some point, Neil also bought a Rogers Dynasonic, which was his dream snare drum. He yeah, spoke he got about. it. Um, wow. Yeah, he got it. Yeah. So when he first joined Rush, that was the kit. It's a, it's the, the Dynasonic and 13, 13, 13, 14, 16, and, and a pair of 22 inch bass drums, chrome slingerland yeah. kit. Was um, there a reason he had the two nine by 13s? I mean, is that, did he mention I, that to have this two of the same drums? Honestly, don't know. I I do know that um, Keith Moon's kit, you know, I mean, I spoke about Keith Moon before as being a huge influence on Neil, and this is a known thing. And Keith used three 14-inch toms. He used three of the same size on his two bass drums. So, you know, maybe it was just kind of like, ah, you know, just do whatever. If you listen to those recordings, um, he tuned those three, actually the four, the 16 as well, but the he, there's not a huge pitch difference between those toms, um, the way he tuned. Like he, it, it's sometimes a little bit hard to tell which tom he's using when you listen to those recordings. Um, the next kit that we'll get to had a sort of wider, he went with sort of a greater spacing of sizes between those four main toms. And you hear a lot more, his tuning changed too, and you hear a lot more distinction between each tom. But sure. with Chromie, they're, they're all tuned a little bit similar. And um, you can really hear that if you listen to Lakeside Park, there's these sort of isolated tom fills hmm. uh, that begin the tune and, and happen throughout the tune as sort of a little hook of the tune. And, and um, you can you can hear the tom pitches and they don't change a ton for yeah. way, as he's sort of rolling down the toms. Symbol Swap is the first and only online symbol rental service in the U.S., giving drummers the flexibility to try out various symbols and experiment with different sounds before committing to purchase. Whether you're looking to upgrade your kit or you're a seasoned drummer going out on tour, Symbol rentals are cost-effective for upcoming gigs, recording sessions, or discovering new sounds. Browse through Symbol Swap's extensive collection of symbols and add those that you would like to try to your cart. Then just check out, and the symbols you selected will be conveniently delivered to your door. Now you get to experience any symbol on your own kit. If you like them, you can extend your rental or choose to purchase. Not what you're looking for? Then just send it back with the prepaid shipping label. Symbol Swap carries over 20 brands from the top names and symbols, as well as one-of-a-kind handmade symbols by independent symbol makers from around the globe. Go to symbolswap.com and use promo code DRUMHISTORY for 10% off your next symbol rental. That's symbolswap.com with promo code DRUMHISTORY for 10% off. While we're on Chromie, I just wanted to ask just briefly, you know, what was the state of the drum set in when you guys Ooh. were doing the restoration? You know, I'm sure that's a whole hour-long conversation there, but... 
It was not good. Um, it was really, really road worn. Um, I mean, first of all, Rush toured really, really hard throughout their career. Like their final tour was still, you know, a long tour with a lot of dates, something like 70 gigs or something like that. And, mm. you know, they were spacing them out, you know, they didn't usually do consecutive dates and they had a full road crew and everything, but man, these guys did not take it easy ever. But in those early days, they were touring constantly and doing lots and lots of one nighters, consecutive nights, um, very little help, very little road crew. And anybody who's done any sort of touring or even just done rock shows where there's like three bands on the bill, you know how much of a scramble it is to get your gear on and off stage and yeah. stuff gets stuff gets bashed up. And, you know, yeah. especially in those days, I mean, drums were not, you know, with all due respect to our love of vintage drums, you know, bass drum spurs and tom mounts and things like that were just not very roadworthy. They, they, you know, you, you a vintage disappearing spur like you'd find on that Slingerland kit. Somebody's carrying it and accidentally hits it against a guitar amp. That spur is going to possibly get like shaved right off, you know, yeah. and you know, you're not going to find that as much with modern hardware, but you know, that kit had a lot of scratches, a lot of big gouges um, in the finish. Um, there were also a lot of just missing parts. Um, it, it, didn't really come with any hardware, I think, except for maybe the the stands that the concert toms were mounted on. Um, so we had to figure out, we had to study all these old pictures. Um, and, and Michael Lowe and I actually did most of this work, and mostly Michael, I should say, actually. Um, it did all of this work with like finding as many photos as, as he could um, contacting fans who had taken photos and asking for like high res scans of photos they'd yeah. taken at shows that were never published and zooming in and like trying to figure out like, th so most of his symbol stands at that time were early Pearl, which is interesting because Pearl weren't really on the map as much in 74 as they would have been certainly 10 years later. Sure, um, yeah, that's, that is and, interesting. And, and this is actually interesting when, when Dean, um, was working on restoring the kit and needed to source a bunch of Pearl symbol stands. He actually bought a bunch from Steve Maxwell's store that, believe it or not, used to be owned by Elvin Jones. As a little jazz tie-in, Elvin wow. used Pearl stands with his Gretsch kit in the 70s, the exact same kind of straight symbol stand. So, um, and Steve had a bunch of those that came from um, Elvin Jones's widow after Elvin passed. So Dean actually bought those and and used them with uh, with Chromey. Um, well, I I will throw out that like I have heard in doing some of the stencil MIJ episodes that the early Pearl um, hardware on their early MIJ kits were n noticeably better than maybe some of the other brands mm. where you know it might. There's a bunch of different brands that would be under different categories, but um, perhaps it was a, hey, this is pretty good quality stuff and it's also affordable. Uh, but they, I just remember hearing Pearl was the top of the Japanese hardware at that time. That makes sense. And also they're not uh, flat base stands. We're talking about, you know, somewhat more modern stands for the time with a, with a sort of a proper tripod base. And, yeah. and, you know, they're relatively light by today's standards, but for, for those days, they actually would have been pretty heavy. So that might've been something that he would have looked for would have been, you know, yeah. we want something that's going to hold up. Do I see a canister thrown on uh, the, yes. the, a couple of these pictures? Yes. That's interesting. Yes. Um, it's a Ludwig canister throne. And also he was using, um, Ludwig speed King pedals at that point and actually continued to use those well into the eighties. Um, it wasn't until around the point of the red kit that he started using Tama Camco pedals, but yeah, he used speed Kings for all of what I think a lot of people consider, you know, a very classic period of rush if not the classic period the 70s up through you know moving pictures is is all speed kings um no. and, but you don't hear a squeak on any of those records interestingly so <laughs> yeah they managed to I guess get that's that a good thing control. i mean <laughs> yeah yeah so there was a slingerland hi-hat stand too and that remained with them through uh the moving pictures era um but one thing i wanted to mention was apparently when they went to long and mcquade um, that was also where Neil picked up a 22-inch ride cymbal that um, 
much, much later, it came out that that was actually a Zilco symbol, not a, uh. not technically a Zildjian. So Zilco was, you know, basically a, 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 a brand owned by Zildjian that was made in the Meductic New Brunswick factory in Canada that later became the Sabian factory. Yeah. Um, and that was sort of a secondary factory for various reasons. I mean, th- people should listen to your uh, interview that you did with uh, Andy Zildjian on Sabian to, yeah. to find out the history of that. But um, that was a, that was a Zilco, the 22-inch ride. And interestingly, people usually refer to it as a ping ride. Um, I don't know if Zilco I, – I, I'm sure there's somebody who's an expert in Zilco history would know if they actually designated their models – that way but i suspect it was just a 22 inch symbol and maybe yeah. some of them were light some of them were medium some of them were heavy but that symbol that ride i think is actually lighter than a ping ride by today's standards would be because that symbol is a little bit lower pitched and has a little bit more spread to it um there are certain recordings where that ride i mean he used that ride on everything until he switched to Sabian. Every Rush recording is that ride symbol from gotcha. the very beginning, from the first record he did with them, Fly By Night, all the way through Vapor Trails is that ride. Interesting. And um, a really good record to hear it on is is Counterparts from 1993. Just the way it's recorded and mixed, it's, um, it's, it's a bit more upfront in the mix, and you can really kind of hear the overtones of that symbol. It's a great sounding symbol. And it's got a bit of a lower pitch, so I don't think it was as heavy as some people think it is. It's certainly mm-hmm. not, you know, like a Tony Williams jazz ride kind of a thing, but yeah, it's also yeah. not like, you know, a super pingy, super high pitch kind of super dry ride either. So the other symbols would have been, um, he was already using 13 inch hi hats. Um, he talked about his Rogers kit having um, a 20 inch symbol, an 18 inch symbol, and 13 inch hi hats. Um, so he continued that setup. Um, so he's got 13 inch high hats, 22 inch ride. Initially, he's got an 18, a 16 and a 20, three crashes, those three sizes, and then a splash. I think it was an eight. It might've been a 10. It's kind of hard to tell from photos. And he's got a cowbell. And initially he had the cowbell on his left, kind of above the hi hat to the left of the first rack tom. If you're, if you're looking at it, you know, from behind the kit. Um, and then through that first tour and so they, they do that first tour. That's kind of touring in support of their first album called just the self-titled album called Rush, which, uh, Neil is not on. That's their earlier drummer. John Rutsey is on that record. Right. And then in 75, um, Early in 75, they were write and record the Fly By Night album, and that's the same setup. Oh, I should talk about the heads, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's some experimentation with the heads, but mostly he's using um, Remo CS black dots on the bass drums. Um, later on, he started using um, – Remo also made a variation of the CS that had clear dots. It's the exact same head with the additional sort of dot in the middle, but they made a clear version. So the dot is there, but it's clear. Um, he sort of went back and forth throughout the, um, and also, sorry, also on the snare drum, same head on the snare drum, CS black dot. That's clear with the black dot in the middle. Um, Tony Williams used those heads. That was a very popular head in the seventies, but sometimes he's using a clear dot. He would kind of on the bass drum and the snare drums, he would kind of go back and forth. I suspect it was because the clear dots would have been hard to find and maybe he'd special order a bunch, but you know, maybe they'd be on the road and they'd run out of, you know, and they'd have to go to a store and the store would only have the black dots. So you see pictures from behind his kit, even well into like, um, uh, I mean, there's a video they did in 1984 for After Image on the Grace Under Pressure record, and he's got a black dot head on the snare. So I think mm. he was still either experimenting or just using what he could get in, you know, yeah. as far as those heads. But that was really his sound for a long time until uh, Test for Echo when he switched to DW. That, that He was always using those CS heads. The front head was um, a logo head. He had a couple different ones that went on Chromie, but I think they were just Evan's um rock heads so evans made a few different heads in the 70s um and 80s they they had they're sort of most famous for the hydraulic head which is a two-ply head with oil in the middle 
And that was designed to kind of give a very muffled sound. And then they had another head that was just called the rock head, which was the same thing, two plies, but without the oil. So he used on Chromie and many subsequent kits, um, rock double ply on top with a mirror finish. It was, he would refer to it as, as Evan's looking glass heads. And I don't know <laughs> that's if that's cool. what Evan's, yeah, what Evans would call, if that's what they called it, but it was just a chrome finished head um, that was actually reflective. So that's on the top. And the bottom was Evan's blue hydraulic heads, which is really interesting that he used a very heavily muffled head on the bottom, which yeah. you would think would really kind of like cut down on resonance. Um, but that's what he used until, I'll get to this later, until 1981. But that's the mm. head combination on on Chromie. Wow. I love the Chrome on Chrome. I mean, it's just like, it, it's, it's a, cool it's a vibe. Yeah, for sure. I should I should mention, you asked about the condition of Chromie. Um, when Dean got it, it actually had Neil's heads on it. They actually had the heads that Neil last played, you know, towards the end of, you know, he used that kit until May of 77. And and it had whatever the last set of heads that he used um, with That's Neil awesome. stick marks on them and everything. Yeah, that was something that I was really amazed to see was was actually the, the you know Neil's own used drum heads was was really really cool with with you know his. If you look at pictures from above the kit, you see that his stick he was very precise. This the, there's a very sure. like clear He's sort grouping. of center and a radius of, of like, you know, kind of a very clear circle of stick marks. You know, he wasn't yeah. hitting off yeah. center very often. Um, no. Was he a heavy hitter? Like when he played, I mean, he seems like he would ergonomically, he'd be a smart guy, but were they changing heads a lot? I mean, did they have to, did he burn through them or? So he talks about this in a modern drummer interview from 1980. And he, he mentions that, um, so I'll get to the concert toms in a second. He he mentioned that the concert tom heads he thought sounded really good when they were brand new. So they changed them every week or every two mm. weeks because I don't think he'd break them, but they would just kind of lose a snappiness that he liked. But then he says specifically the Evans looking glass heads need a couple of weeks to break in before they really sounded good to him. So they would they would leave them on as long as they could. Um, gotcha. So I, I suspect he may have been breaking some snare heads. Um, he, he mentioned also, I think it was in that same interview that he had once broken a, uh, he'd broken the, the, the top off of his bass drum beater. Um, and back in 74, when they were doing a, uh, a TV show filming and he snapped the top of the beater, the beater ball came off and then the post of the beater went right through the bass uh -huh. drum head. So they Jeez. had to stop the filming and change the bass drum head. So after that, he started putting a bunch of duct tape, wrapping duct tape around the beater post right below the beater ball so that in case that snapped off, there was still like a, a wad of duct tape there <laughs> yeah. that he could at least kind of finish a tune before they would oh, then man. have to change the beater out. So that was secondary beater. To, wow. <laughs> yeah. But to answer your question, yes, he was an extraordinarily powerful and heavy hitter. And I, um, I talked about this, um, on Mike Dawson's podcast. Um, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but I really realized that, um, when I saw them in April of 94 at the Meadowlands in New Jersey on the counterparts tour, and I happened to have a seat, um, right on the side of the stage on Alex's side and really, really close to the stage. So I had this great view, like straight down the stage to Neil, you know, if you know his kit, like that side, the ride symbol side is kind of the side with the, the least amount of stuff. So you could really, you could see him. Mm -hmm. And I was actually quite close. And it, it, being that close, I realized how hard he was hitting and not just in like a, you know, pounding kind of way, but to musical effect, to great musical effect, an incredible amount of intensity and energy came from the amount of power that he was putting into every single stroke. And I've noticed it since. If you if you look at videos, he's raising his stick to play a backbeat on the snare drum. The stick is coming back behind his head. He's raising the stick all the way up here every single time. And every single fill is at like you know this incredible like amount of power and volume and that's why those fills actually cut through the music 
You know, you, and he talked about this again in interviews. He said, you know, you can't do that stuff and kind of like finesse your way through it because in a rock band, a heavy rock band, you won't hear it. It won't yeah. cut through. It won't have any presence in the mix. It'll just kind of sound like, Ugh. you know, but to get <laughs> yeah. that kind of, to get that kind of clarity, you need to really hit hard. You need to hit yeah. every single note. I think Tony Williams kind of had a similar you know, by the seventies, you know, Tony's sort of like big power approach was kind of similar, like putting a lot of arm into every stroke to get projection and to get sort of those fills to really sit in the mix in that way. Yeah. Well, it worked clearly worked mm-hmm. for him. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, for the sake of time, we should move on, but I do want to note just that I find it. I, I've, I've seen it on other drummers in, in this time. I like, there's a photo where the splash, the eight inch splash is on its own stand as because now you always think of it having a little arm. It's just so funny to see the tiny little splash on its own stand, which it's just what you did. There's no right. clamp with an arm coming off of it. But the closest thing you have to that, which he started using soon after, is the sort of bass drum hoop mounted yes. uh, symbol holder, which um, he used Ludwig. Uh, Ludwig made one that just sort of clamped onto the bass drum hoop that he. Um, put later a splash symbol and a six a second 16 inch crash on so but but the the reason too i think that that splash symbol stand also held initially just a single cowbell and throughout it appears throughout the fly by night tour so 74 into 75 he was sort of collecting cowbells because you see as the photos go on as the tour goes on he starts out with this one large cowbell which i think would have been an lp either a bongo bell or a um mambo bell those are sort of the lower pitched models that lp Mm. make um and then you see a second one and then you see some agogo bells and then another one and then at some point he gets towards the end of um or middle of 75 he gets a very important accessory for him which was um a company called gone bops used to make a triple i think they actually called it a triple agogo bell but it's actually a triple cowbell. It's these three small cowbells. And his particular, there were a couple different versions that came in different pitches. And his, I believe, were kind of based around an A major triad, where the highest note was an A major. And the reason I know that is because if you listen to some certain tunes, like um, he uses them at one point in Xanadu, and I believe at that point of the tune they're playing an A. Maybe they're playing an E. Anyway, the highest pitch, the highest pitch cowbell that you hear him play is the same pitch as the 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 root of the the the, the tonic of the tune. Sure. Um, nice. So anyway, that comes into play in in seventy five, and that's a really important that triple a go go, and yeah. then a and then a, a sort of medium size and a low pitch cowbell. That five cowbell array that mounted off the splash stand is something that he stuck with until the very end and, and yeah. would use it, you know, in tunes and also in his solos. And that's something I always really love that part of his solo. I always love the little cowbell oh part. It's, it's super cool. One other thing that we got to mention with Chromie is that, um, after when they, when they, um, so that's the, that's the rig, but towards the very, very end of the fly by night tour, right before they go into record caress of steel, Later in 75, he somewhere along the line picks up a set of four concert toms that he put up on his left, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch and 12 inch concert toms, which for anybody who doesn't know, concert tom is a tom tom without a bottom head. And for whatever reason, he couldn't or didn't want to get a, um, a set of concert toms that matched his kit because the, the for chromie the concert toms are actually a metallic copper finish they don't actually perfectly match the kit and you can see that in color photos from that time and on the concert toms initially he's using either there's there's one photo where you can see he's using cs black dot heads but most of the photos you see from that time period, and also when Dean got Chromie, he's using Ludwig silver dot heads on the concert toms, mm. which is a slightly different sound. Um, and also, at some point, um, he stopped using the Dynasonic and started using a very, very famous snare drum that is sort of, you know, people talk about all the time as, as Neil would either refer to it as number one or he refer to it as old faithful. Um, apparently his drum roadie at the time 
popped into a pawn shop and bought this Slingerland snare drum for $60. And it is a uh, five and a half by 14 Slingerland artist model snare drum. Um, not the solid shell version, but Neil's was a three ply with reinforcement rings. And that also had the same copper finish as the concert toms. And oh, that cool. snare drum stays with him again until he switches to DW. That's the snare drum that he used on basically every live show and many of their recordings, if not most of their recordings. So that's wow. a very important addition to the kit at yeah. that time. For $60. And then they do, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. He definitely got his money's worth on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it ties together the color of the, uh, you know, the different the, uh, right. look with the concert, Tom. So it's like, it's as if it was on purpose uh, with that. But yeah. All right. Yeah. So shall we move on to the mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. 77 to 79? He's a Slingerland guy. Big endorser yeah. for Slingerland, you know, I mean, that's he was never an endorser, huge. actually. Ah, he was never an endorser. He never signed with them, um, was never officially a Slingerland artist. His first endorsement was was Tama a bit later on, um, interestingly. But he um, um, it's possible he might have been an officially an, a Zildjian artist before the Tama thing happened. But he never was with Slingerland officially. And, and he spoke about that in a drum magazine interview where um he was talking about switching to tama why he switched to tama and he said you know slingerland were kind of faltering at the time in the mid to late 70s they weren't yeah. maybe weren't doing as well or something but he said he there was never anybody who approached him or had any interest in you know nobody nobody approached him or you know i don't know if they reached out to anybody and didn't get a response but you know a lot of those older companies were still struggling a bit to kind of figure out what to do with rock drummers you know by that yeah. point rock drummers were hugely important but i think in the 70s some people were still maybe older people who worked at those companies were still struggling to see the importance i mean you don't really see bonham in ludwig literature you don't even see ringo in ludwig catalogs in the no. 60s it's I it's mean, they, like what could have been like neil could have like saved Slingerland. It could have been a new totally. generation. It could have been a Ringo effect with Neil Peart as the face, but it's just an interesting time. Old, the old mm-hmm. guard, old companies, yeah. young hippies with long hair and big bushy mustaches. As I'm looking at some of these pictures, it's like, you know, whatever it didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, so yeah, the next kit, um, uh, it's May of 77. They've, they've, released uh 2112 they released the live album this is when they really start to blow up this is where they kind of become successful and independent in the way that the record label was just going to leave them alone and let them do their thing because obviously they found this following so um but they really start building they start touring just in an insane amount of touring at this point and in may of 77 he gets a new slingerland kit and it's around this time that he starts getting all of his gear um, from a store called the Percussion Center, which was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And that was a store owned by a guy named Neil Graham, um, who I was lucky enough to meet before he sadly passed away. Um, Neil was a lovely guy. Um, and he really kind of helped. He became kind of an equipment advisor to Neil and would help him with like, he, this is when you start to see Neil's kits become more elaborate. And you start to see Neil needing, okay, I want to mount a set of crotales on top of the temple, uh, on top of the concert um, orchestral chimes, the tubular bells. How do I do that? Neil Graham is the guy who's going to figure out how to do that. I need a gong hmm. stand and I need a mallet stand and just things like that. And, and Neil sure. would kind of build those things for him and figure things out. Um, Neil in the percussion center also offered this interesting service at the time called vibrafibing. And if you remember in the 70s, well, we don't remember, but um, in the 70s, there was a, 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 a period of time where fiberglass drums were very popular. Pearl and Tama and I think some other companies made fiberglass shell drums. And yep. um, Neil always used wood drums, but uh, the percussion center offered this service where they would basically coat the inside of the shell with a very thin layer of fiberglass. And there, I was reading up on this actually earlier today, and they used this machine that like spun the shell around and created this sort of centrifuge. I don't really understand it, but basically you ended up with a very thin coating of a very reflective 
surface, which was fiberglass on the inside of the shell. And it made the drums brighter and probably project a little more because there was a bit more cut. And um, they also talked about it evening up the overtones. I don't really know what that means exactly, but that's what you'll hear them them refer to. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the Pearl wood fiberglass drum sets i don't know the construct i've played those a lot but i don't know the construction Mm. as much but i imagine it's just the the inside is uh adding fiberglass and i have i have heard that it does actually uh projects very well so okay uh, so he did do that then right on his kits he yes so starting with this the second ceiling and kit which um is in a it's a black chrome finish it's i think it's listed in the catalog as black chrome and some people refer to it as black chromey as opposed to chromey the earlier kit um but this is the the kit that's used on the farewell to kings and hemispheres and the tours um uh you know supporting those and this is where he settles into the sizes that he would use for quite a long time um Mm. so he stops using 14 by 22 inch bass drums so So this kit has 14 by 24s, a pair of 14 by 24 inch bass drums. Now the main rack toms, the concert tom sizes remain the same, 6, 8, 10, 12, up on his left above the hi-hat. The first rack tom, this double-headed tom, is an 8 by 12. So that's smaller than than chromey. Second rack tom is a 9 by 13. Third rack tom is a 12 by 15. And then the floor tom is 16 by 18. So bigger sort of you know range of sizes and it was around that era too where he started tuning in a very specific way where the 12 is tuned very 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 high the 13 is tuned pretty high the 15 is tuned kind of low and the 18 is tuned super low so now you listen to rush albums starting at um Pharaoh to kings you you there's no doubt which tom he's using even if he's doing fills sure. he's going quickly between them there's a very distinctive um melodic voice to each tom you hear you know a lot more kind of i think it's great it it it, it oh, yeah. just brings out more interesting and sort of dynamic drum parts there's more yeah. m- you know melody happening especially um, for him being such a monster drummer it makes sense it's more fun to hear each individual thing <laughs> you know, yeah, it's obvious yeah. now but and this was on the cover of modern drummer i'm sure that was that was in yeah, yeah. Uh, 80 though the 80, the issue yeah. was april april may 80 so that was which uh, they probably shot it earlier, and that you know. that photo is from seventy nine. Yeah, actually, okay. by April eighty, he was using it. The next kit after that, but yeah, mm. it, you know, these kind of things happened a little slower oh, yeah. in those days. But that photo was the first time I ever saw that kit because my drum teacher in sixth grade um, had that issue of Modern Drummer and and uh, let me borrow it. I s- still happen to have it here in my home. So, <laughs> and he's sorry, never forgiven you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mr. Fung. I still have your copy of April, May 80, Modern wow. Drummer. So, um, the one he's yeah, missing. So that, <laughs> yeah, right. So that kit, yeah, that was that was a great sounding kit. And um, it had the, the, you know, the fiberglass inside. Now he also starts adding more percussion instruments. Um, by this point, now, around the, the, the earlier kit on the la- 2112 tour, he started using a glockenspiel on one tune on the very end of a tune called In the End. And I think that was kind of, he just set it on a table or something behind him. But by this point, he gets a much better sort of orchestral quality. Um, I believe it was a Deegan. I should know this. I don't actually know who made, uh, I should know this, but it was a high quality glock set up on the left to the left of the hi-hat he gets a set of timbales so he adds a set of uh, uh, 13 and 14 inch timbales made by slingerland those are brass shell timbales that are on his left sort of under the hi-hat he adds a bell tree um he adds more wind chimes he had like a, a very basic sort of set of almost wind chimes like you'd hang from your porch before this you hear them on by tour and the snow dog on fly by night but now he starts getting more elaborate better quality wind chimes he gets a set of temple blocks um an important symbol that he adds now this is actually where he starts sort of experimenting with chinese type symbols and this is something that i've always been really fascinated with neil is the evolution and it happened very quickly 
but the evolution of, of Neil's use of Chinese symbols. So um, the first one he bought, and he, the, actually that April 1980 Modern Drummer, he talks about this in, in great detail. So the first thing he bought was an 18-inch Pang, a Zildjian Pang, which mm. was a model Zildjian made in the 70s and early 80s that I think had kind of a flatter flange to it. But it's just a slightly different shape than a normal Chinese symbol. And he got that and he said he wasn't really happy with it. And he said he used it more for sort of symbol rolls and swells. And he said specifically it sounded like a phaser, which is like a guitar effect. Sure. So um, you hear that, like sometimes when you just hear him do like a symbol roll, um, sometimes it's his big 20 inch ro- uh, crash. But other times, if it sounds a little more electronic or wispy, it's actually him sort of doing a swell or a mallet roll on the on the on the pang. And then the second symbol, the second Chinese symbol he got was a twenty inch Siljin swish, and he mounted that just to the right of his ride symbol. And he said that had a lot of attack, but it had a lot of sustain too. And he, I think, was looking for something that he could use a bit more rhythmically. So I was looking at all these photos from the Farewell to Kings tour, seventy seven into seventy eight, and the first photo that I see where he has a Wuhan China is in January of 78. I think he said specifically he got it at Frank's drum shop um, in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it's, those are great I think, Chinas. I mean, those are... They're amazing. Uh, they're, and they're always... the che- Everyone knows they're affordable. And like everyone's yeah. had a Wuhan China in their life. That's pretty... I didn't know Neil had one. That's awesome. He had... Yes, he used them again until he went with Sabian. And he, they were very thin. They tend to be thin, and um, you had to kind of clamp them down pretty hard so that they'd stay still. And, yeah. and you they know, break. he probably, yeah. yeah, I suspect he probably went through a lot of them because if you look at photos, sometimes they look like they're 18, sometimes they're 19, sometimes 20. You can see sort of a different, you know, the, the flange or the lip, the edge of the symbol, like, looks different in different photos. So I think there were a lot sure. of different ones. So initially, he hung the 18 inch or whatever Wuhan on his left above the concert toms. Now, if you listen, there's a, there's a live recording from the farewell to Kings tour that, that rush released um, on their farewell to Kings 40th anniversary box set. And it's also on um, their live album, different stages as sort of a bonus CD. So this is a live, a professionally recorded live recording. And if you listen with headphones and you hear the way the drum set is panned, you hear the swish on his right, which is the lower pitch, sort of longer sustaining cymbal sound, Chinese cymbal sound. And then you hear the Wuhan, the very short one, and you'll hear it panned to the left, um, mm. on the left side of the kit. So um, that's how he used it on the Farewell to Kings tour. But by the time they go into record hemispheres, he mounts it on the right above the 20-inch swish. So now, to the right of his ride cymbal, he's got... A, a Wuhan China and right below it, a 20 inch Zildjian swish. And then above those two into the right, he's got an 18 inch pang. These are three very different Chinese symbols. And this is hemispheres is where he starts to really use the Chinese symbols as a rhythmic effect. You hear him doing, um, you hear it on, um, on, uh, Liv- Livia Strangiato, um, where he does these, these, um, uh, patterns where he goes between like the ride symbol and the Chinese symbol, um, the, the usually the Wuhan, um, sort of like offbeat eighth notes, like ride, ride China, ride China, ride yeah. China. Like ding Kinda, dong, you know, he, ding, he does like an ding, upbeat ding, thing. Ding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's and, super cool. Yeah. It's a very signature Neil thing. Yeah, and it is. um, and that's where you start. And and it's really it had a lot to do with where he put it in his kit because it's right next to the ride symbol. That's where he had room to fit it, I guess. But then he gets into all these cool patterns between the ride and the Chinese symbol. But if you, when I see transcriptions sometimes of Neil's drumming, I see people just generically saying like, okay, China here, but maybe not always making the distinction uh, between which of those three Chinese symbols he's using. Um, And if you listen to something like the intro to Red Barchetta on Moving Pictures, you'll hear that he's actually hitting the Zildjian swish a lot in the intro and the outro to get this longer sustained Chinese sound. Yeah, which that's a specific symbol in itself where the swish was like used by a bunch of jazz guys for a long time. That's right. 
has its own. I, I hope to do some an, an effects symbol episode, but like Ooh, cool. the swish knocker and all that stuff. I mean, it's very specific as opposed to like a smaller Wuhan China that's whoosh, in and out. You know, well, there's there's a history with all of those things, actually, just as a very, very quick sidebar. Um, jazz drummers in the 1920s uh, were using what we know, what we think of now as Wuhan type Chinese symbols. Um, Dixieland era drummers were using them as kind of effect symbols, like short crash symbols. But then in yeah. the 30s, a drummer named Dave Tuff, who played with Woody Herman, would use it as a ride symbol. You put rivets in it and would ride on it. And then later in the 60s, 50s and 60s, Mel Lewis kind of brought back riding, you know, in a jazz context, playing the Chinese symbol as a ride symbol. And he would use sometimes a Wuhan, a larger Wuhan, or sometimes a Zildjian Swish or a Swish Knocker. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this whole school of, of Mel Lewis-influenced drummers, which comes from Dave Tuff, um, using... Chinese symbols as ride symbols and and all those yeah. different variations. So yeah, that's that's a whole other thing I could talk about <laughs> yeah. for an hour. Or so yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um, all right, we'll ca- carry on. So yeah. so hemispheres. A few other things that get added at hemispheres. Oh, I forgot to mention with uh, Pharaoh to Kings in seventy seven, he adds um, a set of tubular chimes behind him um, that he uses on Xanadu and and um, uh, closer to the heart. Um, which is a super cool sound. And it just, they look amazing. Yeah. You know, a big set of tubular <laughs> chimes behind you. That's just super cool. Um, yeah. For hemispheres, he gets a set of, I, and I don't know if it's crotales or crotals. Those it sort of, Zildjian make them. They're, they're a, um, you know, sort of an ancient finger symbol that's tuned to a, a you know, a, an octave mm. from C to C. Yeah. He gets yeah. a set of those, mounts them above the tubular chimes. Again, this is where Neil Graham comes in to figure out how to mount a set of these things on top of your tubular chimes. Um, he gets even more wind chimes. Um, he also adds a timpani for hemispheres, and he adds a big gong above the timpani. So this all fits <laughs> Just behind so him. so much stuff. I this mean, is the- where he starts to ha- be surrounded by stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and he's, he's, he has these, he, it, around Farewell to Kings, they build these sort of like racks on either side where they hang his wind chimes and his temple blocks end up going up there. And it's, it's this whole thing. He's, he's really now surrounded by stuff. You can see the pictures, um, yeah. you know, it's where he's sort of surrounded by all this stuff and he's got triangles hanging off of the racks. And a lot of this stuff is used on the tune Xanadu. Xanadu has this sort of two minute intro this very atmospheric intro where he's playing these little rhythms on temple blocks but playing wind chimes and hitting triangles and doing all this sort of light yeah. um and beautiful percussion stuff sort of orchestral more percussion than, I, there's nothing wrong with being just a drummer it's more what i am but he's more than that i mean he's he's a true musician with with all of the different uh, things he's experimenting with and why not? Absolutely. You know, I mean, he clearly has the skill for it and so you know, someone's paying for it. So <laughs> just do it. Keep getting. Yeah. But the thing is, too, if you read interviews with some other drummers at that time, you'll see people leveling criticism, not specifically at Neil, but people say, oh, these rock guys have these huge kits and they don't play half of it. And that was true of some rock drummers or definitely some rock drummers who had these giant kits and you listen to the music and you really, you're kind of like, dude, you could just play this on a, on a four piece and a, <laughs> yeah. a couple of symbols, you know, yeah. with all due respect, it's kind of there for show. And, and it's cool. The show is cool. It looks amazing. But Neil used every single piece of the kit. He used, there's, that's there a was point. a use for everything that's in there. And there was, you know, there's a reason that triangle is there. He's going to, he's going to need to hit that at this precise point where that's just the right texture for that for yeah. that tune yeah, um for sure so, yeah so should we move on to the next to getting into the tama era yes mm-hmm. let's move on to tama and uh just to kind of let people know i think that the plan will be similar to when i did the peisty episode it was sort of like wow this is a lot of information that you don't want to like rush at the end we're going to do tama there's two kits we're going to do 80 to 86 full detail paul saying everything that he knows about these we're then going to break and do a part two, which we'll record probably next week. And, and then on that one, we'll do Ludwig and the DW era up through the end of Neil's uh, life uh, and career. So for now, though, let's jump into Tama, which this was a lot of people's favorite era of Neil and their introduction oh, yeah. of having a poster on their wall and stuff like that. So let's talk about yeah. Tama. 
Yeah, well, it helped too. I think that this was his first endorsement, and that you know this is also when Modern Drummer was really coming into its own, and and um, Neil was appearing in ads, and Neil was also getting deeper into writing and appearing in Modern Drummer as a writer writing articles, um, and so he his profile just you know really gets bigger and bigger. So I think these kits get associated with with that era and with people just a lot of people learning about him. So yeah. he. Um, so yeah, so he's playing the Slingerlands um, through the uh, the Hemispheres tour, which is an enormously long tour. Uh, they finish up in um, the summer of '79, and I guess they take a little break, and then they go in to start rehearsing and recording Permanent Waves. And this is where he ends up uh, getting Atomic Kit. Um, they did they wrote stuff for Permanent Waves, and then they did a very brief tour for a couple of weeks in September. 79 where they were trying out some of those new tunes they're playing spirit of radio live and i think free will as well and halfway through that tour so you look at the pictures from that tour 79 uh september 79 the first couple of dates he's using the slingerland kit the black chromey kit and then suddenly one day he he shows up with this Tama kit. So it must have been delivered to him. It probably was delivered to the percussion center of Fort Wayne. And mm. they did all of the customization that they actually did the finish for this kit. So I wonder if this kit was actually maybe a, so, so it's, it's a Tama superstar kit. I should get that yeah. out of the way. And, sure. um, Thomas Superstar uh, drums at that time. Now, this is an interesting period because I did a bit of research, and I'm not a Tama expert. Um, people like Robert uh, Teleria know everything about Tama, and I, I defer to somebody like him, and I apologize if I don't have this right. But from what I could tell, in the 70s, Thomas Superstar were either four-ply or six-ply they they okay. talk about they mention both in catalogs from around 78 79 um my understanding is neil's kit is six ply superstar which is six ply birch um and relatively thick shells um and this is actually i i don't want to get too deep into this we can get into this with the candy apple red kit the next kit but you know with with different shell plies with with shell construction like you know you can have what you know, six ply is whatever, you know, they could be six, ve- like each individual ply could be very, very thin. And a mm-hmm. six ply kit can still be a thin shell or each individual ply can be thick. And then you have a six ply kit that's very thick. So I actually yeah. don't know what, um, I had something in my notes, I think about that, that, um, yeah. So 70s Thomas Superstar are four or six ply, six millimeter shells with rings. And gotcha. I think, I don't think Neil's kit was that. I think his was six ply, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it had rings and I don't know what the thickness was, but they sound like thick shells to me. Yeah. And definitely with the next kit, he wanted thinner shells. So um, the sizes are all the same. He still has the timpani, he still has the gong, but the drums are Thomas Superstar. And the percussion center did this custom finish. Um, that's a rosewood finish and neil talked about having some antique rosewood furniture at his home and he wanted to replicate the look of this wow. furniture and it's this very so they sort strip, of strip did they strip it down and refinish I, I, it, or? I don't know they i mean superstars came in this natural birch finish often that was one of the more pot that's like billy cobham's drums Billy Cobham was the guy who really put Tom on the map as a pro line. You know, he was their first major endorser. Um, Him and Lenny White were both endorsers and they, they really like built that company from, 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 um, you know, being it before that they were, you know, a stencil company, I guess. And, um, so, so if you look at the catalogs, it's just, it's Billy Cobham all over the catalogs, Lenny White. And, and I know Bill, Neil was a big fan of Billy Cobham for sure. Um, I suspect probably Lenny White too, because Lenny was in Return to Forever and playing his mm-hmm. butt off at that time too. So they made natural birch finished drums. Maybe the percussion center started with a set of, of those and then they, they, painted over them this this rosewood finish yeah but it's this very beautiful yeah it's a gorgeous finish and they also did brass plated hardware i assume that this was done by the percussion center as well i assume they took all of the lugs and hoops and everything and actually coated them in in brass and this Mm. is the first kit that neil had that was brass um 
plated hardware, which is something that he stuck with through basically the rest of his career. Every yeah. of his every one of his major kits had brass plated hardware. The, so the cymbals stayed the same. The percussion stays the same. The only difference with the percussion instruments is for some reason when he got this kit, he also swapped out the gong. If you look at Hemisphere's era photos, like that Modern Drummer um, cover, he's got this gigantic gong. Um, with the Permanent Waves era kit, with the Tama kit, he suddenly has a smaller gong that has a Peisty logo on it. So for mm. whatever reason, maybe it's just smaller and easier for the road crew to carry, but that's yeah. what he has from 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 September 79 on. Um, the heads are the same. Um, he still is using Speed King pedals, um, Slingerland hi-hat stand, but um, all of the cymbal stands, I believe, everything switches over to Tama at this point. Um, they were making extremely high quality hardware then. They still do, yeah, of course. Absolutely, um, yeah. You know, so he switches over to that stuff. Um, there's a great photo that I sent you of his kit um, on uh, at the. There are actually a few photos from the Permanent Waves recording sessions, and one of them there's a black and white you see of the band. Um, and what's actually interesting about this is um, you see a couple of additional snare drums. If you look really closely, um, sure, there's yep. a Ludwig Superphonic, a six and a half, a 402 that you see on its side on the left of the photo. And then on the right of the photo, you'll see a Gretsch snare drum. Um, you can sort of see the lightning strainer um, sort of in oh, the yeah. corner behind Alex Lifeson. So yeah. I'm actually interested in his snares. This is something he starts talking about it um for 1989 1990 for the presto album he talks about using different snares for the first time on that record but i wonder if he was experimenting with things even as far back as certainly you know this uh, permanent waves era one thing for sure though is man his drum sound changes literally overnight when he gets this tama kit and not to say anything negative about the slingerlands because i think that he gets a fantastic drum sound on on hemispheres particularly yeah. those drums are recorded beautifully on that record yeah. um but the the attack and the the combination of the attack and the resonance just goes up up, up you know through the roof with the with the first tama superstar kit man those drums just they cut in a certain way and yeah. one of my sort of things as a huge rush fan is is um for a long long time i've been collecting bootlegs of rush um mostly you know some soundboard recordings but mostly just people who went into a concert in 1980 with a little you know cassette recorder or whatever and recorded you know in the house obviously these vary in quality but some of them are recorded really really well hmm. and those tama drums once you get to the permanent waves tour they sit in the mix and they cut through the mix like I mean, the, the, the Slingerlands just did not do that. It's a, it's the Slingerlands are cool, but it's a, it's a muddier sound. It's a less distinct sound. The, the Tama Toms, the, 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 the double headed Toms, 12, 13, 15, and 18 have this cut to them. They have almost a metallic sound. And I, I wonder if yeah. he was maybe a little influenced by Bill Bruford at the time who was using Rototoms as his three main Toms, which had this great sort of clangy metallic almost like a timbali kind of sound right and 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 um it almost could be that he was you know maybe trying to copy that a little bit or influenced by that because his tama toms had that a similar quality did he have the blue hydraulics on the bottom heads as same well? heads exact same head setup as he was using all the way back to chromie yeah so the gotcha. evans looking glass still on the tops and the okay. uh, blue hydraulics still on the bottom and that um that changes uh, on the Moving Pictures tour. So okay. um, I'll get to that in a second. So so yeah. the kid is, as I described, on Permanent Waves. For, for Moving Pictures, he makes a, a, a couple changes. Um, a minor change being he gets rid of the brass timbales, and he replaces them with a set of Tama wooden timbales. Same size, 13 and 14, but just wooden shell, matching shell, you know, matching finish to the uh, Rosewood yep. um, kit. But... He a big thing that he does is he gets rid of the um, the timpani and the gong, and he gets two Tama gong bass drums, and these are really really cool instruments. Gong bass drum is a single headed drum basically that you know Tama still makes them single headed. It's a bass drum size. Neil had a twenty two that was on the floor mounted as a floor tom, and then above it he had a second one on this Tama rollaway stand. And that was a smaller one as a 20. 
and they have this oversized head that fits over the bearing edge like a timpani does. And they just have this indescribable sound, this super low pitch sound with tons of bottom end, um, tons of like sub bass. Um, and it's just such a cool sound. And, and Billy Cobham used them. Simon Phillips used them. Uh, and, yeah. and, and Neil used them. They're, they're on the, the best place to hear them is the beginning of the tune witch hunt on, um, on moving pictures. And I think yeah. Neil just used uh Remo clear ambassadors on the two gong bass drums. So they were really thin heads and they just, you know, probably were really sensitive and, um, but that's they're a really super, cool. super cool sound. Yeah. yeah. I love, I love I, the gong bass drums. I feel like when you see a gong bass drum on a set, that drummer's doing okay. Like if you have enough <laughs> drums where you can constitute having a gong bass drum, it's like, this guy's legit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You don't, you're not messing around when you have a gong no. bass drum. You're just, you're, you know, that, that does, that does indicate a certain level of, uh, of yeah. commitment at the very least. Not many know? gong bass drums on like a four piece set. <laughs> it's just a gong you know, bass that's drum. That's a vibe. You. I think, I think, you know, you know, I do a lot of gigs around New York City where I have like just a bass drum and snare drum, ride some on a hi-hat and I'm just kind of bebopping away. I should add a gong bass drum to that. You, you know, should. just on the right, you know, two piece <laughs> kit and a gong bass drum. I think yeah. that's a vibe. And only hit I'm it once do... in the show and just make it oh, completely yeah. pointless. Uh, let me ask you a question <laughs> about uh, which I don't think you mentioned this before. I'm kind of noticing it in these pictures. Mm -hmm. Was Neil at this point or before this removing the logos from the symbols which is kind of a famous oh. neil peart thing what's the story yeah that? that's right that's a great question um i don't think i've i believe in the 70s when he joined rush zildjian were putting a logo on the bottom of the symbols so i you know in this up until the 60s and through well, through the 60s zildjian only had like the 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 stamp that was actually gotcha. literally stamped into the yeah. into the top of the symbol and there was no other there might have been some ink that said medium thin or something like that stamped on the sure. bottom or top but i believe it's in the 70s they start putting the big zildjian logo on the bottom of the symbols and it, whatever whenever that happened yeah neil was definitely having his roadie take the logos off his roadie also would polish the symbols um, before every show. So they kind of would often have kind of a brilliant finish. Look yeah, they to do. Them. Um, yeah. And yet yeah, occasionally you'll see a picture where that there's actually a Zildjian logo on the bottom of the symbol with Neil. And I think that likely was again, for the same reason that he maybe used black dot heads as opposed to the clear dot heads that he might've broken a symbol. They were on the road somewhere and they just needed to get, a symbol real quick to replace it. And they just happened to get one from a store with a Zildjian logo and they didn't have a chance to take it off. But yeah, gotcha. they would, I don't know what they used, you know, maybe acetone or something to get rid of the logos, but I've yeah, he never that, has. Yeah. It'll affect the sound too. And you don't want to like ruin a symbol, right, but clearly right, they right. Had it figured out. Yeah. He also yeah. didn't use any, you know, like the, the, um, the Tama kit, uh, actually, uh, uh Bob Miller, uh, who owns the the red kit told me that um that the the rosewood kit the the tama badges were actually on the inside facing neil which was the opposite wow. normally they would be on the front you know facing out um for whatever reason he had the kit set up so that they were on the inside and um yeah he doesn't so like he logos was, he's a i he's guess a non not I think, I think he liked um everything to just look very clean and very sort of like i don't know not nondescript i mean his kits yeah. were certainly descript <laughs> right but <laughs> yeah. um but yeah then maybe not have advertising i'm not really sure you know or maybe just to not have writing on it because it's an instrument maybe it shouldn't have writing on it maybe that was yeah. his thought i don't really know i'm sure the brands were like turn it around let them see yeah <laughs> yeah i'm, yeah, I'm like, sure they the were one. <laughs> there were definitely there probably were discussions at board meetings about how can we get Neil to put some logos on some stuff. But he was so popular and so influential and he still managed to sell a lot of drums for Tama yep. and yep. probably a lot of symbols for Zildjian. And I think, you know, the fans knew what he used and he appeared totally. in ads and maybe that was enough for him. He didn't need to have a Tama logo on the front bass drum head. Yeah, yeah. for sure. The only thing to add about the Rosewood kit is that, um, they do the moving pictures tour and then exit stage left comes out, um, which was, you know, a live record from the moving pictures tour. And then they go back out on tour, which was sort of the exit stage left tour, but it's really a moving pictures tour part two. They tour for kind of the whole, a whole nother year. Um, 
sorry, not all another year, like another six months. What's interesting about that tour is that the blue hydraulic heads come off of the bottoms of the toms. And all the pictures that I've seen from the exit stage left tour, he's got clear Remo heads on the bottoms of the toms. So that's a big change. That would have really affected the sound of the toms. Um, although, again, listening to bootlegs from that leg of that tour, I don't hear a big difference. They still sound like the Rosewood Thomas to me. But yep. I'm sure if you were on top of them or in front of them, you would have heard considerably more resonance coming from the toms. Um, so that's actually a big change. And that kind of leads us into the next kit, I think, because he was looking for something more. He's looking for a different tonality and a different resonance because because when they were mixing Exit Stage Left, he was apparently, they, they talk about this in interviews, the band didn't have much to do. It was mostly their producer who was sort of, you know, editing the, the record together and choosing takes and mixing. So they were in the studio, but they were bored. So Neil found, they were they were mixing at Le Studio, which is a studio in um, Quebec that they used to record at a lot. And Neil found this old set of Heyman drums lying around that used to belong to Corky Lang, the drummer from Mountain. Hmm. And I don't know anything about the configuration of this kit, but Heyman, I believe, were like a more traditional, you know, maybe three-ply with reinforcement rings type shell, but a thinner shell than like the six-ply Thomas Superstars would have been. Sure. So he decided, okay, I have nothing to do. I'm going to restore these drums. So he took them apart and cleaned everything up and put new heads on them. And he found that these drums sounded really great to him, and they resonated in a way that he wasn't used to. They really just sort of sung and had more tonality, and they actually recorded some demos where he used this kit. Um so that inspired him to talk to Tama about making a new kit that had thinner shells. And this is what becomes the, the famous candy apple red drum kit, which I think is probably his most famous kit. Yeah. Um, Maybe the DW stuff later was like, mm, people think of that too, but I mean, it's right. It's also the, the, what was a poster on the yeah, water, the, the on banner. that floating... It's very iconic, yeah. yeah. And and those banners sell... So, th- for anybody who doesn't know, Tama, as a promotional tie-in, when this kit came out, um, they made this this sort of fabric banner. It's not a poster. It's actually mm. like a, a banner gotcha. that, that you would hang on your wall that was, you know, featured Neil playing this red kit. And he's actually... Uh, the kid is set up on a raft in the middle of a <laughs> lake. It's just remarkable. I don't... It's, it's, it's a really great photo shoot and and um those banners sell for like thousands of dollars on ebay now it's it's wow. it's crazy they're very very collectible so um yeah so so he uh I spoke to neil graham again from the percussion center and talked to him about what he wanted to do and and they actually apparently discussed well maybe you should go with a company like gretch because gretch still make um a very thin shell drum um, at that time, you know, Gretsch were one of the few companies that didn't go towards, you know, like Tama, like Ludwig at the time, um, were making very thick shell drums, six ply, thick shell drums. Um, Tama's drums were thick. Sonar's drums were sort of infamously thick at that time. The Sonar Phonics and Sonar Signature drums were really, really thick shells, like 12 ply shells or something. So, um, Gretsch were making a six ply shell, but it was a very, very thin shell. But instead of doing that, he said, well, let's talk to Tama and see what, what could be done. And the way that they've always stated it is that Tama agreed to make a four ply version of their regular shell, which would have been instead of the six ply birch superstar, they agreed to do a four ply birch shell for him. Now, when you look at this kit, this kit had reinforcement rings. Now, there's some debate about who actually did this process there's now what we would assume from how neil described this is that they spoke to tama and tama made a six a four ply version of their you know regular birch shell but um robert Teleria, who i mentioned owned the the candy apple red kit for a while and and yep. did a lot of work restoring it um he I believe I, I heard this secondhand. It was somebody posted on a forum that Teleria told them this. So I don't know. I haven't heard it firsthand either from Teleria or from anybody who worked at Tama, but supposedly he talked to somebody at Tama 
who was there at the time, who said that what actually happened was they sent their regular six ply shell and somebody at the percussion center actually used some sort of machine to cut the inside of the shell down oh um, so that it was thinner, like the equivalent of, of six ply. Now I've That's never, crazy. it sounds crazy, right? I, and I, I don't, I, I talked to Bob Milherat who owns this kit now about this. And he told me this, this story that he had heard this, you know, that, that I don't know if he heard it from Teleria or if he heard it secondhand as well. And I couldn't imagine how this could be done without just destroying the shell. I'm, I'm, I don't really the understand the process. The glue is supposed to be, the glue is glued. I mean, we've, that's been talked about on the show. Like, I mean, this is not something where, and it's not, you're peeling it off. You'd think it would get destroyed. Right. It just, yeah. Or it would, uh, it would, you'd get down to the layers and the, the, the glue would take at least some of the shell off with it. I, yeah. I don't quite understand how it could be done. If it could be actually sanded down from the inside. Sanding, but regardless, maybe, yeah. what you do have is a thinner shell, Tama, birch shell. I assume it's birch with reinforcement rings, top and bottom. You do see that, the, you know, there is sort of this, this part of the shell at the top and bottom that's, that sticks out like a reinforcement sure. ring. So yep. that's something that I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't have like the true story behind that. I don't know. I can't say for sure definitively it was one way or the other. I would guess if I was to say logically, I would think Tama could have, why couldn't they have made a four ply version? They supposedly used to make four ply shells for the superstars in the seventies. So it seems logical that they could have done that. Yeah. But for their I most also popular, don't... one of their most popular indoor seas, just right. And, but I yeah. also don't want to discount you know, what, what other people have said. So I no, will totally. say, I do not know the story, but what we do have is the candy apple red kit. Now that finish, the candy apple red finish initially was done by the percussion center at Fort Wayne for Neil. So they did the original candy apple red finish and this kit debuts in April of 1982, when they did a brief tour testing out some of the, the tunes that would end up on signals. And that's the first time that this kit came, you know, was, was seen. And everything about the setup was exactly the same as it was for the Rosewood kit, except for one thing, um, on, actually for the signals tour, they moved. So I mentioned the crotales or crotales mounted on top of the tubular chimes. When yep. you look at photos from the signals tour, they move them from the tubular for the top of the tubular chimes onto the rack opposite the temple blocks um, on either side of him. But everything else about the size of the drums, the heads. Now this is where he changes the heads a little bit as well. So um, one thing that's very cool is he switches to Evan's red colored heads which just looks so amazing it's with awesome. the candy apple red <laughs> kit. Yeah. It's a yeah. really cool look. Um, not the bass drum and snare drum, but the, the rack toms, the clo the, the, the double headed rack tom. So he changes to, I think he's still using the rock two ply head on the tops and the bottom, I think was just a single ply head, but still Evans red heads. Um, so gotcha. that replaced the Remo, um, cause Remo didn't make a red head at the time. So, um, but, one thing that's interesting is on the um, the videos they did to promote signals at the end of 82 is you can actually see on the concert toms, instead of the regular black dots heads he was using, he actually also has red Evans heads on those. Yeah. But by the signals tour, he's back to using black dots on those um, concert toms. So I think that was not something that lasted very long. Is his snare like on, when he's on mm. the floating in the the water and that that portion yeah. is that still that old Slingerland snare he was using there? It okay. is, yeah. And and I mentioned that that Slingerland snare was maybe I didn't mention that, but that was also copper finished. Oh, I did because it matched. Yeah, you the did. Concert yes, Tops you did. And it's the so, artist series, right? Yeah, yeah, with a zoomatic strainer and yep. you know a, a tone control and everything. So he maintained that same copper finish with all of the different kits. Um, now he talks about this in his modern drummer interview from April 84. He talks about getting that drum painted. He said that the copper finish looked okay with all of the kits. And he said he even looked okay with the Rosewood kit. But once he got the candy apple red kit, he thought it started to look a bit tacky. And if you see pictures of him like floating on the, on the lake and um, there's a photo from them recording signals in the studio and you can see he's still got the copper finish on the snare. 
But by the yep. time the signals tour comes around, he's actually had that, that drum refinished to match the rest of the kit. Candy apple red. It looks like 84. Yeah. There's a picture of him with his leg crossed. It looks like it's gone red. Yeah. Behind yes. him at that point. Yeah. 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 But even before that, like by the fall of 82, it's, it's red. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I see. Yeah. So the signals tour, um, is another long tour and that, Turns out to be kind of the end of an all acoustic Neil Peart presentation. That's um, you know, the next album cycle, the next series of tunes that they write for the next record is when he starts to get pretty deep into electronics. And that's where we get a really big shift and the first really major shift in his drum setup. And I think that's something that we're going to have to leave for next time. Yeah. That's a perfect transition because I the reason I like to for everyone listening and watching the reason I like to split these up and not do a three hour mega episode is it dilutes the in my opinion I think it kind of dilutes the like we're at a pivotal part of his career now and maybe someone who really likes this stuff isn't going to listen to an hour and a half of it to get to that one part that they heard when they were a kid or you know the YYZ solos and things like that Mm -hmm. and all that really cool stuff so um, we are going to pick it up with a part two, uh, which will come out, um, hopefully the following week. Usually that's the order of things. Um, so I'm excited to get into that. That's kind of what I grew up with is watching those like downloaded videos of him with his electronics. And yeah. it's almost as if there's, there's three pro- pro- probably more, but phases of, of Neil. And it seems like now he's in his thirties. Uh, in the, in the early, you know, eighties, 82, I guess he would have turned 30. Yeah, that's right. Actually around the beginning of the signals tour would have been his 30th birthday, September 12th, 1982. Yeah. So he's, he's, it's a transition really. And then a lot of things changed for him. So, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. Uh, there's much more to come. I am so (laughs) happy that you came on Paul, because this is just awesome. And Neil deserves, uh, (laughs) <laughs> this deep dive. So um, <laughs> for everyone listening, feels weird because there's more content to come to like w- we're wrapping up now, but we will be back uh, upcoming. We have uh, all of the electronics. We're going to get into his Ludwig phase. We're going to get into the DW stuff and just more cool things from there. So, uh, Paul, do you want to tell people where they can maybe find out more about you um, while we're you know, before sure. part two, your social media and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, just paulwellsdrums.com is my website. And um, on Instagram, I'm paulwellsdrums, I guess, uh, at paulwellsdrums. Uh, those would be the two major places to find out about me. Yep. Cool. Perfect. Uh, oh, one other. I guess awesome. uh, you t- I have a yep. YouTube channel. Um, but now I'm forgetting if it's... Uh, I think it might be Paul Wells drums as well. <laughs> or yeah, I think I'll put it in the description. I'll find it and, and put yeah. it in there so people can check it out. So, um, all right, great. Well, Paul, then until next time we will reconvene on another day and finish up, uh, with part two. So, um, Paul, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Bart. Honored to be here. <laughs>